Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. Uh, you may have noticed that the date of this lesson, number 141, is, um, is quite a ways away from 140, and that's because I did take a little bit of a summer vacation, a what I would consider a well-deserved break. But anyways, I'm back, and we're back to our regular two-week cadence uh, every Monday. Uh, in this lesson, number 141, we're going to take a look at managing architecture decisions. And I'll show you what I mean um, when we get to that point. Um, so you can see a list of all of my lessons in Software Architecture Monday through my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons, or just click on the lessons link in the menu. Now, most of the material that I do in Software Architecture Monday comes from two books that I wrote with my friend Neil Ford. Fundamentals of Software Architecture, which was published in 2020, and then the Software Architecture, the Hard Parts, which was just published in 2021, I guess. Yes. <laughs> I had to, I had to, wait, what year is it? <laughs> Anyways, most of the material does come from these, but sometimes I create a lesson based on a question that I get in the middle of a training session, for example, or when I'm on a consulting gig. And that's exactly what this lesson is all about. This comes from a question about a company who was indeed using architecture decision records and was struggling with managing those or had some questions about managing them. And that's what I wanted to address in this lesson. Now, way back, if we go in the way back machine uh, to lesson 55, I talked about architecture decision records. And if you haven't seen that lesson yet, or if you're not familiar with ADRs or architecture decision records, um, I'd suggest pausing the video and taking a look at that. But if you are familiar with ADRs, you can review it later. Um, but let me show you and just spend like a minute talking about um, an architecture decision record. Every architecture decision we make as an architect can be recorded as documentation. Uh, typically, each decision corresponds to a certain file, and that's called an architecture decision record. Now, these in spirit are short. It's not meant to provide all this documentation, but really to document our architecture decision. One to two pages long. Uh, usually uh, I use either Markdown, most of the time I use ASCII doc, but you can use plain text as well. Now, the five main categories of an architecture decision. The title, describing what the decision is or the actual decision. Uh, the status, proposed, accepted, or superseded. In the context section of the architecture decision record, and this is where we describe and very briefly, a couple of sentences to a paragraph of what the problem is and what some of the alternatives are. This, I love saying, really is architecture documentation. One of the most important parts of the architecture decision record, of course, is the decision with justification and finally the consequences. Now, in lesson 55, I talked a lot about each of these, but what I want to focus on in this lesson, number 141, is the status. In other words, how do you manage an architecture decision record? For example, let's say an architect or a senior developer um, just created an architecture decision record, an ADR, but I'm not sure if I've got all the material. I'm not sure if I've got everything here, so I'd like others to comment on it. Well, if other people, other developers and other architects, maybe other stakeholders start commenting on it, commenting, when should you consider that ADR final? As a matter of fact, here is actually the question I did receive during one project. Is an architecture decision ever final? And so these all point to one thing, and that is how do you manage architecture decisions. And probably more importantly, what if the decision changes? What do we do? Should we edit the ADR? What, what's the process? Well, let's take a look at all of those questions. First of all, let's say a software architect creates an architecture decision record and would like others, developers and other development teams, other architects to comment on it. 
one of the things I do for this very common situation is to create a new status type. I mean, here's the nice thing. You could do anything you want to with an architecture decision record. So here's the typical form I use. I create a new status type. Instead of accepted, proposed, or superseded, I have a status of RFC, request for comment. And I always put a date by June 22nd. So this kind of status indicates to everybody a request for comment, that's the RFC, prior to making that decision and always specifying an end date. Specifying that end date solves that kind of final problem where it's always just open and people are commenting on it. And so in this case, once that date hits, then it either goes into proposed status or accepted status. And as a matter of fact, I can accept sometimes my architecture decision records. In Lesson 55, I described some of those criteria that I use. Um, however, if it's proposed at that point, it then goes in front of, let's say, an architecture review board or uh, a, a, a group of peers uh, to actually, or maybe it's the lead architect, to actually make that decision and then accept it. And so this RFC kind of allows a uh, latency period before it actually goes into proposed or accepted status. Well, that's one half of managing an architecture decision record. But here's the situation. Based on some of the new requirements, we need to change this decision to something else. What do we do? Do we take that architecture decision record and just change it and start modifying it and reverse the decision and let's say move it from, in this case, uh, uh, a federated um, service bus into a single service bus? Typically, we don't do that. Because you see, the problem is if I change a decision, then two things occur. First, I don't have the history of that prior decision. And secondly, people are familiar with the fact that ADR 67, let's say, was this particular decision. And now the decision completely changes. So here's typically the process that happens for changes that occur. Now, minor changes that don't change the architecture decision itself, but rather add some context or maybe add some justification. In that case, please edit the architecture decision record. Because what we're doing is we're enhancing it, but we're not changing the decision. But once it's been accepted and we reverse a decision or change the decision itself, that's when we create a new ADR. For example, ADR 82. And that's where we apply our changes to change that architecture decision. Now the confusion is 67 still exists and has been accepted. So now we have two different decisions. That's where we get the superseded piece. So notice the ADR 67, the status changes from accepted to superseded by ADR 82. And then ADR 82, once it gets accepted, supersedes 67. In this way, if we're taking a look at ADR 67, we know this is ancient history. It's been superseded already. So one of the things in this kind of practice, which is very common, is to always look at that status before just taking it at face value of what that decision is. Uh, this kind of practice of managing architecture decisions gives us the history and the prior context of why we made a certain decision. And then ADR 82 describes why it was made differently. And these are two ways of being able to manage architecture decision records, leveraging that status piece. All right, well, hopefully that uh, gives you a little more ammunition in terms of managing architecture decision records, especially in terms of changes that occur, um, but also when you want people to kind of comment on it, uh, just to make sure that we're correct in our decision. So anyways, this has been Lesson 141, Managing Architecture Decisions. Um, we're back on track after my vacation.
So stay tuned in two more Mondays for another lesson in Software Architecture Monday. Thank you so much.